Well, good morning. As the Greeks would greet each other, they'd say, Christus Aneste, which is Christ is risen, which is such a neat phrase that we use in the church. We don't say Christ was risen. We say he is because he is now. He forever will be risen. My friends, we are going to take a quick look at what happened this Passion Week as it leads into this Sunday. And so can you advance to the next slide for me, Brenda? And as we do that, <clears throat> I want to open with this great story where Jesus one day is meeting with a group of people. In fact, crowds have gathered all over Jerusalem because they have come together to celebrate the Passover, which is a huge deal. It's probably one of the greatest holidays next to the Day of Atonement in the Jewish faith, at least during this time. And as the city of Jerusalem has swelled to over 2 million people, maybe even closer to 3 or 4 million people, from all over the known world, they have come to celebrate the Passover, which is when God shared his incredible grace and love and became the salvation for Israel. While they were in Egypt, he led them out of Pharaoh's power into the promised land, into his ultimate kingdom. And so they celebrate what God had done for them, and particularly with what God did on the 10 plagues. On the very last plague, Pharaoh had hardened his heart so hard as if to be totally defiant against God that God came and said, Pharaoh, I am going to destroy every firstborn in the entire nation of Egypt. The reason God came across so harshly is Pharaoh had denied the other nine plagues. And the tenth one would, in fact, affect Pharaoh the greatest because his son would be next to rule. And so not only would this take away his son, but it would take away his lineage and his rule. Well, God said, anyone who takes the blood of a lamb and puts the blood over its doorposts of their house, I will send my angels, and when they cross over and they see the blood, they will recognize the faithfulness and trust you have in me, and your house will be spared. And that continues to this day in the Jewish tradition as we celebrate Passover and we look at the idea of God passing over and being our salvation. As this moves into a more modern-day setting for us Christians and followers of Christ, we see that Christ becomes the ultimate fulfillment of that Passover. And so as the city has now filled to capacity, people coming all over the world to celebrate, Jesus makes his triumphal entry, passing through Bethpage, which is the famous city where he raised Lazarus from the dead. And the entire city is now following Jesus on his way to Jerusalem, yelling Hosanna in the highest, waving fig tree branches and palm tree branches and anything they can get their hands on. And as they arrive at the city gates, people begin taking off their cloaks and clothes and putting them on the road for Jesus to walk across. This stirs up such commotion that the entire city begins asking one another, who is this that comes into the city riding on a donkey? And people murmur, oh, it's the Prince of Peace. No, it's that prophet from, from some faraway land like Galilee. Or maybe it was Nazareth. As they begin to gather, Jesus' first move into the city is right into the temple. And he sees how the temple has been mistreated and misused, and it no longer is a house of prayer and a connection place for people to interact with the God of their community. But no, it's now become a den of robbers, where people are misusing religion for their own personal gain. And so Jesus reacts in a way that most of us want to react sometimes when we're frustrated. He begins tipping over the money changers' tables. He actually fastens a whip together, and he drives the animals in chaos all around the place. Well, if you were in the city and you hadn't heard about this king who came riding in on a donkey, you've heard about him now. At this point, the Pharisees and Sadducees couple together and they say, we have to do something with this man. As they go to seek out Jesus, they find him in the temple, but now people have gathered around him, the sick and the blind and the deaf. And as they come close to Jesus, he begins blessing them in such a way that healings are taking place. And again, the message of God's salvation coming to the city of God, Jerusalem, begin spreading through the crowds one more time. Soon after in that week, Judas will go and be meet with the high priests and the Pharisees and Sadducees, and for 30 pieces of silver, he will offer himself as a spy and betray Jesus. He'll show them right where he is and allow them to come, not in the day, but in the darkness of night, in the secret to get him. Jesus and his disciples will make way, and they will have their own meal during this Passover where they'll celebrate, and Jesus will celebrate all the known pieces of the Passover Seder. There are four cups in which they're going to share wine, but when it comes to the fourth, the one of praise, the one where they celebrate God and his coming kingdom, where we become the adopted sons and daughters of God, and we reissue that covenant that he made with Abraham where he's our God and we're his people, Jesus takes the cup, passes around the table, but when it comes to him, he says, my friends, I won't drink this until I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. More on that in a minute. 
The next thing that happens is Jesus goes out to the Mount of Olives. And there he asks his disciples to pray with him as he is feeling the weight and the burden of what happens next, knowing that he was born to die. You see, Jesus isn't just a human being. He's God incarnate or God wrapped in flesh, a miraculous miracle that took place when the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and she gave birth to a son, Jesus. He has to be born 100% human and 100% God so that he can go to the cross. This means that he is faced with every temptation and struggle that you and I are faced with. Yet he does not once falter. He trusts his full life and faith in God the Father. And in doing so, not only does he give us a perfect example of how to live our lives as humans, but he allows himself to be that perfect sacrifice, a lamb without blemish, someone who will then give his life unfairly so that he can redeem ours. And so as Jesus is in the garden, a group will come to gather him. And as they do so, they're going to take him to the chief priest's house late that night, and they're going to argue their case of why this man should die. As they're arguing, Peter will be out in the courtyard wondering what's happening to his master. And at that point, the prophecy made at the dinner table where he would deny Christ three times would be fulfilled. Peter would deny Jesus three times and feel awful about it. In the morning, they're going to take Jesus all the way over to Pilate, and they're going to say, you need to do something with this man. We have met as a council. We have found him guilty as pretending to be king of the Jews. But now, now he's coming after Rome. And if you don't do something with this man, then you're no friend to Rome. Pilate listens to their story, but he can find nothing wrong with Jesus. In fact, no one can. All through these funny court cases, there hasn't been a single piece of evidence that has been true. They're not able to show Jesus as a blasphemer. But they are able to show that he is the Son of God, the King of kings, and Lord of lords. As Pilate listens, he hears that Jesus' ministry began in Galilee, and he says, oh, thank God. That's Herod's jurisdiction. Send him to Herod and let Herod deal with him. Well, luckily for them, Herod has come to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, and so it doesn't take long for them to present Jesus to Herod. Now, Herod has been in an argument with Pilate because Pilate represents Rome. Herod represents the Jewish nation, but now they have found something to come to sides over. Herod likes that Pilate trusts him to make the decision over Jesus. But then he decides, you know, this isn't going to look good for me if I kill him, so I'll tell you what, send him back to Pilate. And so in doing so, he wraps a beautiful cloak on Jesus, mocking him as king of the Jews, but also presenting a gift to Pilate, saying, it's your problem. Pilate doesn't know what to do at this moment. His wife is coming to him saying, I've been up all night with a horrible dream about this man. Leave him alone. Have nothing to do with this. He turns to the religious leaders and he says, I can find no fault in this man. And they say, no, let loose some other prisoners. We would much rather have them than this Jesus crucify him. And as they began chanting crucify him, the crowds grew so loud that Pilate had no choice. He said, so be it. And he washes his hands in front of the crowd saying, it's not my problem, it's yours. You want this done, so be it. But it'll be your choice and not mine. He then releases Barabbas to the crowd, a known criminal, and he takes Jesus into custody to be crucified. Jesus will be beaten, bloodied. He'll be forced to carry his cross through the streets. And he'll eventually end up on the Skull Mountain, or Golgotha, and where he'll be crucified. At that moment, as he's crucified, he will be presented between two criminals. One will mock him, and the other will see him for who he is, and he will beg for mercy, saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your new kingdom. And Jesus says, I promise you, today we will be in paradise. Remember how Jesus didn't drink the fourth cup? At this moment, the cross is overtaking Jesus, and he's losing his life. They take a sponge dipped in vinegar, which is kind of like a very poor form of wine. And they go to serve it to him on a stick. And as it touches his lips, it's as if Jesus is now drinking the fourth cup, the cup of praise, the one in which we come into the kingdom of God. And he gives up his spirit, and he says in a loud voice, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I now present my soul to you. It is finished. And that word finished is such a beautiful word because it means everything up to this point is finished. Everything that's happening now is finished. Everything in the future is finished. It never ceases being finished. As he breathes out his last breath, it says darkness came all over. The place went black. The temple that separates people from the actual presence of God is torn in two from top to bottom. Scholars think it's about three feet thick. And it would need to be because anyone that would walk into the presence of God's 
holy of holies would just be destroyed immediately because we're not pure enough to be next to such a holy being. But today on this day, the curtain is ripped in two. As if God says, not so much can you come be with me, but I'm coming out to be with you. So my friends, as we celebrate Easter Sunday, we're recognizing God coming to meet with us. Jesus' body will be placed in a tomb that was given very kindly by Joseph of Arimathea, who says, here, take my tomb. And as he's placed there quickly, they roll a rock in front of it, and they put two Roman guards in front. They also put a sash across it with the seal of Caesar, meaning if anyone disturbs this, it'll be upon penalty of death. The Roman soldiers are trained guards. They are trained to protect a two-foot-by-two-foot two space with their very life. But you know what? You can't protect yourself against God. Something mysterious happens. An angel shows up. These trained soldiers and killers run away scared. The tomb is found empty, and the stone is rolled away. As Mary Magdalene comes the next morning, she'll be the first to discover this. In that culture, the fact that God would present such a miraculous miracle to a woman seems just mind-boggling. But it reminds us that Jesus is for everyone. Man, woman, child, all races, all colors, all life experiences. Everyone is welcome to Jesus. My friends, we are celebrating that that tomb is empty. Because if it wasn't, then Jesus is not who he says he is. And if he's not, then God is not who he says he is. And what we're doing with our lives is a lie, but it's not a lie. My friends, he has risen. Christus Aneste. Let us continue to celebrate this incredible day. This weekend to spend some time with my extended family. And they had organized an Easter egg hunt for my children. I love it when people do the parenting work for me. And kind of thinking about that, experience you know it was lovely it was great um, my children had just enough of a sugar rush um, before we left and in parents you know this sometimes there's this fine moment and it's it's not even seconds it's like nanoseconds before they go from happy joyful to meltdown and my kids were at that point and so the sugar rush was doing its job so that by the time we got home they were they were done they did not think they were done, but they were done. And I, I was done. Praise Jesus for bedtime. But as we were leaving my dad's house, my niece's boyfriend, and this poor dude, the whole day is getting teased. So Alec, when are you proposing? So Alec, the next family gathering will be your wedding, right? Poor dude. But as I'm leaving, he says to me, hey, Mariah, Easter's kind of like your Super Bowl, isn't it? Yes, yes, Alec, and I hope that at the end when we win that I will be doused in Gatorade. That's the goal. Now, all joking aside, he's, Easter is a significant holiday for us, isn't it? It is what for us where we remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is the bedrock of our faith, and it is not simply an event a historical event at that, but a profound transformation that all of us who follow Christ have the opportunity to experience. Now, those early followers, you know, those folks who knew Jesus, who walked the dusty roads with him, and those who experienced him through the stories of others who had walked with him, you know, people recorded these events. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, James, and Paul all documented their experiences with the risen Christ. And it wasn't just a story to them. It was a life-changing reality. And this reality will birth Christianity and the church as we know it. See, the resurrection reveals God's deep love and desire for personal relationship with you and with me and all of humanity. And it also challenges our assumptions about life, death, and God. And it invites us to embrace a new way of thinking and living. You see, on Good Friday, as we describe it, as Kevin described it for us, they expected Jesus to stay dead. They were not expecting any sort of miracle. They were done. God to them, Jesus to them, was dead. And you can imagine just the miraculous transformation in thinking as they saw Jesus living and breathing on that third day. And so this event isn't just a footnote. It is the catalyst 
that births the faith that wraps us. And this is the thing. When I read about the, those testimonies in Scripture, the one that gets me the most is James. And if you're not familiar with James, he was Jesus' brother. So Jesus is his older brother, and the fact that, you know, Mary and Joseph had kids after Jesus, not uncommon for married folk to do that. But the fact that James believed in Jesus' divinity and his resurrection. Like, think about those of you with siblings, would you ever say, yeah, my brother's God? Now, you may have a sibling who thinks they're God, but the fact that James not only embraced this idea, but then would go on to write about it and live the rest of his life, and the truth of that tells me there's something significant here. Because if you can win over your family, you can win anyone over. Now, for some of you sitting here today, you may be wondering, what, what does the resurrection have to do with me? How does it impact my daily life? Like, this is something that happened 2,000 years ago. These are questions that I think demand our attention. See, the resurrection addresses two fundamental questions that every person grapples with at some point in their life. Is there a God? Is there a personal God? And what is the implications of that belief for my life? What does it mean? And see, since the beginning, humans have sought meaning for their lives. They've sought answers through religion, philosophies, even sometimes superstitions. We have sought meaning and sometimes even to control our lives through these understandings. And the ancient world, you know, was full of this. Just like our lives, it is full of uncertainty, it is filled with grief, injustice, and a longing for something that is greater than the mundane, everyday aspects of life. They wanted something bigger than themselves to belong to. And in the ancient world, you know, 2,000 years ago, people worshiped countless gods. There was a god for everything. There was a god of the home. There was a god of the sea. There was a god of the skies. All of this existed out there. But there still was a sense of emptiness because they kept adding new gods. And there was a lack of connection with the divine. See, the gods weren't for them. They had to be for the gods. They had to worship the gods. They had to give the gods so much so that the gods would bless them or at least not hurt them. And the thing is, the reality of the resurrection of Jesus changes all of this. And it revealed not only that there is a personal God, a God who wants to know us intimately, who already knows us intimately, but desires for us to know him and who cares deeply for us. But it also affirms that life is not a series of random events but a part of a larger narrative that our creator has orchestrated, that Kevin has illustrated for us last week and this week. There is an intentionality. There is a beautiful symphony being composed in this greater narrative that when we step back from our own individual lives, we can see. And the resurrection of Jesus changes all of this. It reveals, yes, there's a personal God, and it also affirms that our life is not a series of random events. So I want us to dig into somebody who had not met Jesus in his earthly life, but would have a powerful experience with Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, as many of us have had. You see, Paul, or as he was known to his mama, Saul, was a deeply religious man. He was trained by the best rabbis, and he had a huge conviction that Jesus and his followers were trouble, that they were perpetuating rumors and that they were telling lies about God. And so Paul is deeply committed to seeing the early Christians eradicated. So this is after the resurrection. This is after Jesus has appeared to his disciples and the tomb is empty. But Paul is convinced that this is a lie and he's going to prove it and he's going to snuff out this lie. He would organize violence and death against Christians. He was that deeply committed to this. And it is as he is on his journey to Damascus, a city where he was um, entrusted to persecute, to chase down Christians and to either arrest them or even have them put to death, that he will have this miraculous encounter. He will have an encounter, even though he was not a first eyewitness to the resurrection, he will have an encounter with the resurrected Christ that will change his life dramatically. And so it is this converted Paul that we find 
when we dig into a story, we find an ax. You see, Paul would go from being this persecutor of Christians to being one of the, the most powerful voices for Christ in his time. He would write the majority of our New Testament, and he would boldly testify to his encounter with the resurrected Christ for the rest of his life to the point he would die for it. That is a change of heart, my friends. And so Paul is in the city of Athens as we enter into this story that we find in Acts chapter 17, verses 15 through 34. And Athens is, at this point, a city filled with ideas, filled with philosophy. You know, just as we enjoy a good TED Talk or a podcast conversation, folks would sit around and have these huge philosophical conversations out in the open, out in the public, and there would be people who would present their ideas and people who would argue about their ideas. They enjoyed a good public discourse. And so this is what Paul engages with. He engages with these folks who have these incredible philosophies, these men who have thought deeply about life and how it all fits together. And so as he engages with them, he begins to talk about Christ. But he does it with them while engaging their intellectual curiosity. He doesn't dis dismiss it. And he actually engages with what they are spiritually seeking. And see, before Paul gets to this point with these philosophers, he has walked the streets of Athens, and he has noticed that there are statues and temples and altars to all the gods throughout the streets, that they are just inundated with images of all of these gods. And Paul's slightly disturbed by all these expressions of devotion and worship, and let, yet one of the altars that he encounters really just stuns him and then becomes the catalyst for how he will talk to these philosophers. And it is an inscription. He says this, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So they're trying to, like, hedge their bets here, y'all. <laughs> they're like, we've got Zeus, we've got Athena, we've got, well, just in case we missed one, <laughs> we'll put this altar to an unknown God. And this actually came about because of a plague that had come through the city, and they had sacrificed to all the gods, and they weren't getting any relief, so they made up an altar to an unknown God, and then suddenly the plague went away. So they're like, let's just keep this in case something else bad happens. And I think sometimes we do that with our own lives. We hold on to things, on to beliefs, just in case I may need this. And I'm not just talking about the crap in your basement. I'm talking about the baggage we carry around with us. And so this is kind of the setting for Paul's conversation with these learned individuals. And as he affirms their intellectual curiosity, he also challenges them with a deeper truth. You know, he confronts them with the reality of a God who has created the heaven and the earth, who has walked among us, who has gotten close to us in the flesh, and a creator who invites all people to seek and find ultimate fulfillment with the divine. See, he says this to them, you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. You have this altar to an unknown God. Let me tell you about this unknown God. This is the God, the only God you need, the only God who has true power. And it's so fascinating to me that in this dialogue with all these people that Paul finds skeptics, he finds some people who are willing to believe, and he finds some people who are a little hesitant, want to take a little more time with it. And I think that's where most of us find ourselves at different points in our lives with new information. We either become like true believers or we go, no, that ain't for me. Or we are a little hesitant to engage it. We need a little bit more time to think on it. But I want us to, to look at these final verses that Paul offers in chapter 17 for us. That they invite us to reflect on our calling as bearers of the resurrection hope. Paul's words. God did this, and he's talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us. You see, most of the Athenians believed that the gods were up on Mount Olympus. They were far from them unless they came down to mess with humanity, right? No, this God that Paul is describing is close. And for in him we live and move and have our being. This God is not only close, but this God has given us the very life we have. 
and empowers us to live this life. Paul is describing for them the transformation that happens when we become aware of the reality of God and his grace at work in our lives. Because the resurrection, my friends, isn't simply a theological doctrine. It is a beacon of hope and assurance for all of us. It tells us that God is not distant, but intimately involved in our lives. It invites us to rethink our assumptions about God, ourselves, the world around us. You see, we assume that dead people stay dead, right? Dead means dead, right? Right. We, we assume that God sometimes is out to get us. Maybe we, we aren't in God's will. We assume that God wants something from us before he's going to do something for us. We make all of these assumptions about God. We make all these assumptions about ourselves, that we are nothing, that we are worthless, that we are losers, that we have nothing to offer this world. And the resurrection flips that on its head. Because with the resurrection, we understand that the dead are raised. And if God can raise the dead to new life, what can't he do with your life? And God is with us and wants good things for us. God's love demonstrated through the resurrection is unconditional and all-encompassing. It offers forgiveness, acceptance, and a new way of thinking. And the resurrection reveals that God will not be contained, not even by death itself. So you Athenians with your temples where you keep God in a box, God blows that box up, thank you very much. He rolls that stone away and he walks right out. God will not be contained. And so when we think about what this forces those folks who were listening to Paul that day, how that would have been radically different from the way they saw the world. No wonder some were skeptical and some were like, I got to think about this a little bit more. But others were like, I want this. I want this. Because I want to follow a God who loves me deeply, who wants good things for me, who is not out to get me or catch me doing wrong, but desires a personal relationship with me, regardless of my past failures, mistakes, doubts. The resurrection continually reminds us that we are deeply loved, and forgiven and invited into that beautifully vibrant relationship with our creator and the power that raised christ from the dead is what exists in us today as believers that when the holy spirit is is part of our lives we have that same resurrected power in our lives empowering us to live with hope purpose and joy and if you do not think those are powerful things live without them if you live without hope purpose and joy your life is dead but through the resurrected power of christ we can live with that hope purpose and joy knowing that our lives have eternal significance in god's grand narrative that narrative that creven has described so beautifully for us the last two weeks how it starts from the very beginning leads to the cross leads to the tomb and shows us that god will not be contained and it commands us as Paul will say, to repent. Now, he commands all people everywhere to repent. And that's a hard word for us sometimes because we think it means this. We think when somebody says repent, oh, that means I got to give up my sin and I got to act good, right? I got to give up my sin. I got to walk away from it. And the thing is, Paul's not talking about sin here. He doesn't even mention the word sin because it's not about sin. See, the Greek word here is two words, metanoia. Meta is powerfully meaning change, and noia means your mind. Change your mind, he says. It's time for everyone to adopt a new way of thinking, because the way you think determines how you will live your life. It will determine your behavior, how you treat other people. The way you think empowers you to live a life of hope or empowers you to live a life of despair. And so Paul is saying, change your mind, it's time to change your mind about how the way the world works, change your mind about the gods, change your mind about the God of heaven, the God who has left heaven to come be with you. Come to live among us because he wants to close that distance. He's not far, he's revealed himself. He showed up, that is a powerful thing for somebody to show up and God does it continually. He showed up, he walked among us, giving us proof He has given us proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. You see, God has done all of this, but the proof is that he has raised Christ from the dead. You see, for Paul and the Athenians, the resurrection was a current event. It was something people talked about. 
because it validated it validated everything Jesus claimed about himself. It validated everything Jesus said about God. It was a current event that validated everything God said about you, about me, that God so loved the world, that God so loved you, that God so loved me, that God so loved us that he sent his son to close the gap to bridge relationship, to bring answers, to clarify who he is, and then to take our sins away, to carry them off so that we would bear them no more. Because this was a current event, this means that there were people who had walked those dusty roads with Jesus, who had sat at tables with him and broken bread, could share their experience saying, I shared a meal with God in the flesh, God in a body, And if God in a body is anything like God in heaven, then God is love, and God loves. God loves well, because I have experienced that love firsthand. The resurrection of Jesus provides that assurance that it is true. It is documented not only in our scriptures, but in historical documents. God is love and has revealed himself because he loves you and he loves me. And if you reach out, as Paul says, you will find him because he is not far from any of us, and he is not far from you. Resurrection not only restored their hope in what God was doing in the world, it validated everything that Jesus had done and taught on earth. And I think it it hits into something in us that is innate. We value new life, don't we? We want to see things that are halfway dead come back to life, don't we? We do this with our plants. We see this on All these reality shows where dilapidated houses are suddenly transformed into magnificent homes. Thank you, Jojo. That a beat up car is suddenly a powerful hot rod. That a failing restaurant becomes a popular place to dine. We love to watch and celebrate the beauty of restoration and renovation, which makes old things new. And I think that is something that is innate in us. We hunger for resurrection. We hunger for restoration, renewal, redemption. We are inspired by these stories because they are such an intimate part of us. It's planted deep within us, this hope for resurrection and transformation. Paul wanted those who follow Jesus to replace the fear of death with the assurance of their salvation and new life. Yes, we will experience physical death but we will also experience resurrection. Paul implores them, begs them to embrace the great promise that death is not the end. He shines the light of resurrection as a way to understand, to invite us to see what it reveals, that Christ at work in our lives is powerful, that we are enabled to become the person that God created each of us to be, to be fully transformed in this life, here and now, that grace offered to us in love empowers us to grow in love it's not just about getting fire insurance y'all it's about a life here and now that gives us great value we recognize god's love just as we are but we also affirm that god loves us too much to leave us where we are and that is the beauty of the power of resurrection not simply a singular event but an ongoing process that lives itself out in our lives so that our character becomes more like Jesus. Compassionate, loving, gracious, faithful, and kind. I like those kind of people, don't you? I want more of those people around me. I want to be that person for others. Compassionate, loving, gracious, faithful, kind. The good news that this is not a do-it-yourself project. As much as we watch those reality shows about how we can do it, or we YouTube, how to fix our sink, This is not a do-it-yourself, but a do-it-with-God project in our lives. It is more than a project. It is a process. It is a lifestyle. It is how we live out our faith, that we are insisted in this process by the very power that raised Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit. And we pursue these qualities not to be acceptable to God. Hear me on this. You don't do this to be acceptable to God. He has already accepted you, declared you worthy because of who he is, not anything that you have done. But we pursue these qualities not to be acceptable to God, but because God is at work in our lives, empowering us to grow in grace so that we can offer love to God in return 
as well as we can offer love to our neighbor and ourselves. We want to be Easter people like Paul, who live out our lives in response to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So my friends, as we celebrate Easter and reflect on the resurrection, may we embrace the profound truth that God is near, God is love, and God's resurrection power is at work within us, transforming us from the inside out every day. Amen.